In Unit 6, we'll be covering the family life cycle. The notion of a life cycle can be applied to all of life and provides us with an understanding of the normative processes encountered by families over time. There are differing challenges and differing problems along the family life cycle. Chapter 16 focuses on intimacy in the later years, including the important role that grandparents play in a family. What exactly is the family life cycle? Well, it refers to the emotional and intellectual stages you pass through from childhood all the way through your retirement years as a member of a family. In each stage, you face challenges in your family life that cause you to build or gain new skills. Gaining these skills helps you to work through the changes that nearly every family goes through. Now, not everyone passes through uh, these stages smoothly. Situations arise, such as severe illness, financial problems, or the death of a loved one, which have an effect on how well you pass through the stages. And fortunately, if you miss skills in one stage, you can learn them later stages. Carter and McGoldrick identified six stages in the family life cycle. They noticed there are differing challenges and differing problems within each stage. One is the unattached young adult. 2. The newly married couple. 3. The family with young children. 4. The family with adolescents. 5. The launching and moving on stage. And 6. The family in later life. Various changes occur over the family life cycle and our relationships with each other also change. Younger and older couples are more alike in some ways than couples in their middle years. People's experiences in passing through this cycle will depend on a number of things, including various kinds of change that occur in society and within the family. For example, there is the experience of the death of one's parents or of a child. Another change involves grandparenthood. A third change relates to marital disruption and remarriage. In stage one, the unattached young adult, the major tasks are the selection of a way of life and the selection of a partner. One emotional task is differentiation from parents. In this stage, there is differentiation of self in relation to the family of origin, the development of intimate peer relationships, and the establishment of self in respect to work and financial independence. Moving on to stage two, the newly married couple tends to have certain family strengths that are at a very high level. One of the important tasks facing the newly married couple is that of forming their own marital system. One of the more important tasks is establishing a pattern of resolving conflicts. Another challenge is the dilemma posed by your need for closeness and the danger of a fused relationship. In the third stage of the family life cycle, the family with young children, the couple commits itself to an additional person or persons and to changes in the family system. Spouses face the challenge of the new roles of mother and father, as well as those of husband and wife. Marital satisfaction tends to decline in this stage, but for some couples in the child-rearing years, marital satisfaction increases. Several areas of concern can make the fourth stage, the family at midlife, particularly problematic. These areas are aging parents, adolescent children, and midlife concerns. At the midlife stage, the effects of the aging population are increasingly evident. People must deal with their aging parents, which may include caring for parents who become ill, disabled, or frail. Adolescents undergo important physical, intellectual, and social definitional changes. At adolescence, then, parents and children must work out a new system. Adolescents also need increasing autonomy and independence. Because conflict arises out of opposing needs and interests, the unique needs of adolescents can make this stage one of increasing conflict. The most frequent sources of conflict between adolescents and parents are everyday matters. Adolescents see most of their stress arising from daily hassles with parents. Parents who have responsibilities for adolescent children and aging parents at the same time are referred to as the sandwich generation. A growing number of Americans, therefore, are turning to some kind of formal care rather than assuming all of the burdens of caregiving themselves. Family life experts now identify a new stage of development called early or emerging adulthood, 
referring to the period from the late teens through the mid to late 20s. It has not merely extended adolescence, though. Emerging adults have not yet taken on the full set of responsibilities of adulthood. Being an emerging adult is not a time of fun and games, but rather that of assuming responsibility. Emerging adulthood reflects social and economic conditions that make it increasingly difficult for individuals to fulfill all the conditions of adulthood. In addition to facing responsibilities for their children and their parents, the couple in stage four faces complex marital and personal challenges. Midlife is a time when people become increasingly concerned about their own aging process. Not everyone has a midlife crisis, but everyone faces a set of challenges and concerns at midlife. Men typically deal with four fundamental concerns, mortality, destructive and creative tendencies, recognizing and developing both the masculine and feminine aspects of their nature, and the need to be attached to and separate from the social environment. Women tend to reach the midlife crisis point sooner than men. Obviously, the intersection of the turmoil of adolescence and the parental crisis of midlife creates a fertile climate for considered family strain and diminished satisfaction with life in stage four. When families do have conflict, it may partly be due to a lack of rites of passage. Various rites of passage may occur a number of times during the adolescent years. In stage five, the couple must deal with the children moving out and being on their own. Family therapists stress the need for differentiation, the need for each member of the family to be an autonomous individual as well as an integral part of an intimate group. When the children leave, the parent-child relationship also changes. In addition to their relationship with their children, an empty nest couple faces a number of other changes. At least some couples never experience or have little time to experience the empty nest due to delayed launching and boomerang children. It may be difficult for a couple when the children leave home. Some men find it painful for the children to leave. Women who have invested themselves totally or nearly so in child rearing will also find the empty nest painful. For most people, stage five represents a time of increasing marital satisfaction and renewed family strength. Overall, then, the empty nest is likely to be a stage that is gratifying and filled with a new zest for living. Increasing numbers of people are experiencing the grandparent role. For the most part, grandparenting is a positive experience in people's lives. There are different types of grandparents, formal, fun seeker, surrogate parent, reservoir of family wisdom, and the distant figure. Grandparenting is challenging and isn't just about pleasure. Conflict may also arise in the grandparent-grandchild relationship. When asked about the relationship with their grandparents, young adults agree that it is very important to them. While the grandparent-grandchild relationship is not as intense as the parent-child relationship, it is a unique and potentially highly gratifying relationship. One of the discussion questions this week explores the various types of grandparents you may have had and the role that they played in your life. In the aging family, there is a shift in roles. Like every other, this stage has its satisfactions as well as its problems. Retirement can be a crucial time for a couple. When a married couple first retires, marital quality tends to go down because of the adjustments required. In part, adjusting well to retirement depends on whether the retirement is a voluntary one. Once the initial adjustment is made, marital quality tends to go up. A couple in the sixth stage is more likely to be oriented maritally than parentally. That is, spouses are more likely to focus more of their time and energy on their relationship with each other than on that with their children and grandchildren. For most couples, marital satisfaction in this stage tends to be high, higher in fact than at any stage since the couple was first married. Although the aging couple is more maritally than parentally oriented, family relationships are still very important. Still, conflict between parents and adult children can continue into later life. Other relationships are also important at this stage of the family life cycle. At nearly every age level, women are far more likely than men to face the death of a spouse. The distress comes from a loss of intimacy, a loss of identity, and the negative connotation associated with being a widow or a widower.
many individuals get on with their lives by dating and eventually marrying again. When we think of widowhood, we think of someone who is old, sad, and depressed. But a person can become a widow or widower at a younger age. Widowhood involves dealing with the emotional loss of a spouse, and everyday tasks can remind one of the spouse. Loneliness is quite common. There can be a loss of identity because a person's self-identity is partially formed through social interaction and significant long-term relationships. Some recent trends tell us widowhood can be very difficult for some. According to a 2016 study by the University of California, an increased number of senior citizens are experiencing worse health, more depression, and less access to care. Because widowhood can decrease household income and other resources, those who have recently lost a spouse are particularly susceptible to this trend. A 2012 study by a team at Rochester Institute of Technology showed that widowers are 30% more likely to die after the recent death of a spouse, compared to normal risks of mortality. Social isolation is a risk many widowers face, compounded by solitary living. A Pew Research study reported in 2016 showed that an increased number of men live alone, 18% up from 15% in 1990. Here's a graph of the data from the Pew Research study I just mentioned showing the gender gap for those 65 and older who are living alone is narrowing. There are actually divergent trends as you can see here. Since 1990, older women have become less likely to live alone and older men have become more likely to live alone. There seems to be a corollary effect to living alone as an older adult, which I think is worth mentioning. Older adults living alone are somewhat less likely than older adults living with others to be in contact with their grandchildren. Among adults ages 65 or older with at least one grandchild, 43% of those who live alone say they are in contact with their grandchildren at least weekly, compared with 60% of those living with others. Older adults living alone are about twice as likely as those who live with others to say they communicate with their grandchildren less than once a month. So why do we bother looking at the family life cycle and going over these trends? We're learning about the value of relationships and how they are crucial in keeping us happy and healthy. One of the major goals in this course is to have a better understanding of the challenges faced by today's families and what it takes to strengthen families, marriages, and relationships. Intimacy is the most important source of a richly fulfilling life. People name relationships as most important to their happiness more than any other factor. Personal relationships are the most important factor in a high quality of life and relationships are the most frequently named sources of joy.